Hello and welcome to the nurse station. I'm Maria Mobley and this video is shock part two. So I hope you had a chance to watch my initial video on shock. Just a reminder, it talked about all the universal implications for any individual or patient that you're caring for that's experiencing shock. So, you know, there's a trigger that results in decreased blood pressure and eventually decreased cardiac output. And we know with decreased cardiac output that we have less oxygen perfusing to our cells and tissues. So this video, my goal, my hope is that now we can differentiate between the types of shock. Because as nurses, we do different nursing interventions based upon your patient's presentation. Okay, so I have it split into the four categories of shock. I do want you to understand that distributive shock, I put a little acronym, NAS. He was one of my favorite rappers growing up. If you don't know NAS, I'm sorry, you should look him up. But I put an acronym, NAS, because I need you to understand in distributive shock, you have three types of shock that we can go into. So neurogenic, anaphylactic, and septic shock, okay? So let's, let's start with this column. So I have kind of color-coded it. Black means it's universal across all types of shock, whereas blue is the real differences you should focus on. So with distributive shock, I want you to think the pathophysiology or the why behind why this is, is occurring is there's a trigger. For instance, neurogenic shock traditionally occurs or, or does occur after a spinal cord injury. Anaphylactic shock we know is a result to exposure to an allergen. And then septic shock we know is related to infection. So that trigger causes vasodilation of blood vessels. So what does that mean? When our blood vessels become extremely dilated, right? So my veins, my arteries think the pressure inside the vessel goes down, okay? So this is distributive shock. Now let's look at hypovolemic shock. That's probably one you're most familiar with. Hypovolemic shock is a loss of fluid or blood products. So a lot of things that can cause hypovolemic shock, dehydration, hemorrhage, um, all of those you're losing volume from your body. Now we have cardiogenic shock, and I want you to think that your heart muscle has been damaged. So ischemia, has occurred to the myocardium, so your heart muscle is damaged, and if your heart is damaged, think, it cannot pump as effectively. So with cardiogenic shock, a trigger occurred, for instance, a myocardial infarction, a heart attack occurred, is an example that could cause cardiogenic shock. You have ischemia to your heart muscle, and therefore your heart is damaged and cannot pump as effectively. And we know the whole purpose of the heart is to pump oxygenated blood to the rest of our body. And then obstructive shock. I want you to think of obstructive as something that is blocking blood flow to the heart. So there's obstruction of blood flow into the heart. So the heart muscle itself is not damaged, but there is something blocking blood to be perfused to the heart, which can eventually result in the heart getting damaged. So the example I'm gonna go with is a pulmonary embolism. So I have an example down here. A pulmonary embolism or clot, right, can block blood flow into the heart. So those are the four different categories of shock. Now let's go into universals. Y'all know on my first video, we absolutely, absolutely have low blood pressure in all types of shock, right? Our concern is with decreased blood pressure, it eventually leads to decreased cardiac output, again, leading to hypoperfusion or decreased oxygen perfusing to our cells and tissue, which we need oxygen to survive, right? So universally, let's look at the heart rate. The heart rate goes up in all categories of shock, which makes sense, right? When I have a decreased blood pressure, my heart is gonna pump faster and faster and faster to try to circulate whatever oxygenated blood I have left in my body. Except, remember in blue I do exceptions. With neurogenic shock, this is very different. They don't experience tachycardia, they experience bradycardia. Very different, they have a decreased heart rate with neurogenic shock. Let's look at another universal. Look at all categories of shock. 
all of them have a decreased urinary output. And doesn't it make so much sense, right? Your body is wonderful. It's, it's a miraculous thing and always tries to cope to help you survive or to help your patient survive. So when we have decreased blood pressure, aren't we gonna try to retain onto as much fluid as we can to try to cope and help our body? So we have decreased urinary output in all categories of shock. Now let's look at skin. You would think, and it makes sense, when we have decreased blood pressure, decreased circulating oxygen in our body, our body's gonna cope, right? And it's gonna shunt all the oxygenated blood, whatever we have left to our vitals, our vital organs, right? Our heart, lungs, our brain, those organs need oxygen for the body to sustain life. So you would think cool, clammy skin, right? I don't care about perfusing my hand right now. I want my blood vessels to constrict, to shut all the oxygenated blood that I have, that I can to my vital organs, right? To my core. But look at this difference. What about distributive shock? Remember, we talked about how the blood vessels dilate in distributive shock. So think about it. If I have blood vessels, my arteries and veins dilated, doesn't blood pull, right? Won't a lot of blood stay in my periphery? And if you were to touch that skin, it would actually be warm and flush. So that's a very big difference with your distributive shock. And also think about your triggers, right? Septic shock is caused by an infectious agent. We think um, of an infection. Wouldn't their white blood cell count be elevated? Leukocytosis, wouldn't they have a fever? What about anaphylactic shock and all the histamine release related to exposure to that allergen? Wouldn't, they could even have rash, right? Wouldn't their skin be warm and flush? Same with neurogenic shock. If y'all remember and think back to spinal cord injuries, and other things associated with that topic, the body might not be able to regulate body temperature as well. So a big difference with distributive shock. The skin is traditionally warm and flush versus look at all your other types of shock, cool and clammy. The body is trying to cope. It's trying to shunt all the blood back to our vital organs. So if we touched their arms, it'd probably be cool and clammy, okay? Now, let's think about other differences and i'm going to focus now on cardiogenic and obstructive shock when we think about shock we are thinking low volume right fluid volume deficit that's what always pops into our mind but you always have to think about the trigger so let's think about it our trigger is a heart attack it has now caused damage to our heart muscle and now our heart cannot pump effectively well think about it our right side of our heart pumps blood into our lungs to get oxygenated and therefore sends it to our left side of our heart to pump blood into our aorta and send it to the rest of the body. What about heart failure clients? Don't they have signs of fluid volume overload? So if your heart can't pump effectively, yes, we have decreased perfusion, but we also can have signs of symptoms of fluid volume overload. So something very different with cardiogenic shock. You could see jugular vein distension. You could auscultate crackles in their lungs. You might see peripheral edema, right? Signs of fluid volume overload that you would never see in hypovolemic shock, for instance. What about obstructive shock? The example I gave you is a pulmonary embolism. Same thing. If we are blocking blood flow to the heart muscle, which is supposed to pump and contract, and perfuse our body, and now we have a blockage of that organ to be able to do what it's supposed to do, couldn't we again have backup? People with obstructive shock, you might see in jugular vein distension, they might complain of chest pain. Think, an example, a trigger is pulmonary embolism. Think about the, how those patients look, right? So you could potentially see signs of fluid volume overload or, or symptoms we always associate with fluid volume overload in different types of shock. So that's why I kind of put a big difference here with cardiogenic and obstructive, okay? So just, just a, 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 a quick review, right? Heart rate, traditionally tachycardiac for all forms of shock except neurogenic. Skin, traditionally cool and clammy for all forms of shock except distributive. Okay, so neurogenic, anaphylactic, septic shock. Urinary output is decreased for all forms of shock because your body's trying to hold on 
to whatever fluid it has left. But you can see some symptoms we classically see in fluid volume overload, such as JVD, such as auscultation of crackle, such as chest pain, and two categories of shock. And this includes cardiogenic and obstructive. So make sure you note those differences because based upon the trigger, I just want to always emphasize your trigger will always guide your nursing interventions as well. So remember from my first video, universally, we are giving fluid to these individuals. We could give vasopressor support, right? Medication that cause vasoconstriction to try to help increase blood pressure. Hemodynamic monitoring is needed. Oxygen as indicated. Protection of the airway and intubation if indicated. All those things are universals. However, let's go down here. This is your interventions and hone in on what is absolutely different. So let's start with neurogenic shock. Look, a medication that you would only give for neurogenic shock, an example is atropine. Why? Because neurogenic shock is one of the only shocks that presents with bradycardia. And we know if that heart rate gets too low, we might have to give medical intervention, such as atropine, to increase it back up. What about anaphylactic shock? Think the first medication that should come to your mind with severe allergies is the EpiPen. That's IM, intramuscular injection of epinephrine. This is very different. We wouldn't give IM epinephrine to other categories of shock. It's specific to anaphylactic shock because there was a trigger that is now causing a, a systemic allergic response, right? Inflammatory response. And also think of the symptoms that can occur. Think about angioedema. Somebody with anaphylactic shock could have swelling in their mouth, their tongue, right in the chest and face, we have to protect their airway. So I am epinephrine for an, uh, uh, anaphylactic shock. What about albuterol, breathing treatments? Very specific to anaphylactic shock. And I put a dot, dot, dot. You need to think about any medication you can give with severe allergic reactions. What about diphyhedramine, right? AKA Benadryl, can't we give that? What about glucocorticoids, I'm sorry, glucocorticoids, right? We need to think about things that help reduce inflammation. All those things can be given in conjunction with your IM epinephrine to try to control that allergic response. What about septic shock? When you think septic shock, we should think we got to get an antibiotic in and best practice, evidence-based practice says hopefully within one hour of them presenting with these symptoms. So we always got to think we need to know, right? We need to know what antibiotics specifically. That's why we should always get a blood culture times two prior to antibiotic administration, but we no longer wait anymore. We give these individuals broad spectrum antibiotics even before the culture is back to, because it's shown a better outcome. Evidence has shown a better outcome. So think, with septic shock, we are getting blood cultures times two. We're getting um, an antibiotic in them quickly, as opposed to, you don't see that in the other categories of shock. Now let's move over to hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is, is all those universals I said in the first video, but please don't discount your trigger, okay? So if it's a gunshot wound causing hemorrhage, of course you apply pressure. What if, and one thing, uh, I don't know if y'all know about me, I don't do OB, LMD, I just don't have that gift, but a uh, postpartum hemorrhage, right? Doesn't the uterus need to contract? Aren't there medications we can give to help that uterus contract to try to stop the bleeding? Or the fundal massage, I'm pretty sure that's right. Don't quote me if I'm wrong. I need to get an OB nurse on here. But, right, ways to stop that trigger from them bleeding after having a baby. Um, now look over here, cardiogenic shock. We would never, never would you think to give a diuretic for somebody who is experiencing low blood pressure, loss of volume, right? But for cardiogenic shock, if your heart muscle is damaged, if your heart cannot contract appropriately and pump that oxygenated blood to the rest of the body, we might have to help alleviate the workload on the heart. So with cardiogenic shock specifically, you could see administration of diuretics. You could see administration of nitrates, your nitroglycerin, because that helps your trigger. Remember the example I gave is a heart attack. So the example that could cause this is a heart attack. So you could see NCLEX style question says, 
what would warrant immediate intervention by the nurse, right? If we ever saw furosemide, y'all remember furosemide is a diuretic, AKA Lasix, but we need to know our generic names for the NCLEX. If we ever saw furosemide administered for hypovolemic shock, that would warrant intervention. You should stop and question that. But we can give furosemide for cardiogenic shock. Look over here, obstructive shock. Your medications are always reliant on your trigger. So the example I give is a pulmonary embolism. We might be administering heparin. We might be administering um, th thrombolytics, things that help alleviate a blood clot for this type of shock. And have you ever seen heparin or heparinization occur for, for instance, hypovolemic shock? What if the cause is cardiac tamponade? Do y'all remember thinking back to that disorder? They might have to have cardiac intervention. So do y'all remember peri, or I'm always horrible with this word, pericardiocentesis, right? They might have to remove the fluid around the sac of the myocardium to help alleviate that problem. Cardiac tamponade is another example of a trigger that can cause obstructive shock. So make sure you understand the trigger. Make sure you know your treatments. And down here, I put patient positioning. In my first video, I talked about shock position, right? So when we have low volume in our body, you want to put them in shock position. So the head is down here, feet are up. And so by gravity, all the fluid, your oxygen that's in the periphery, you hope to get back to your trunk, to your core. Again, your vital organs. So your heart, lungs, brain. That's shock position. But this isn't universal for all shock. If they're in anaphylactic shock and their airway is compromised, would you ever lay them flat, right? So you have to also think about what is the trigger? What is the best patient position? If their airway or breathing is compromised, you most likely will not be using shock position. You might have the head of the bed elevated, okay? So I hope this helps. Again, always know your universals, but this quick chart helps you really differentiate key points in terms of assessment for your four categories of shock and also nursing interventions that I would think about and consider in the care of these patients. As always, we're better together. If this helps you, please help another nursing student along the way. Y'all take care.